Thank you, Joe, and again, <clears throat> it's an honor to be part of the panel today and to be with you this morning. Uh, now that Dr. Finelli has given us this uh, algorithmic approach to uh, kind of predicting um, common bile duct stones and different strategies for efficiently managing those, either with uh, pre-op, intraoperative, post-operative intervention, I wanted to transition to intraoperative cholangiography. I have no uh, relevant disclosures for this uh, presentation, and, and this is what I want to concentrate on in the next 15 minutes. I want to give a little bit of a review of the indications for intraoperative cholangiography, and then talk about the technique, starting with room setup, some uh, specifics about the technique, a review of anatomy, which may be surprising to some of you when we get to that, and then a few tips and tricks that can help with uh, some challenging scenarios. Um, I wanted to start, though, by kind of reminding us about how common common bile duct stone uh, issue is. Uh, Dr. Peatlin, in his uh, initial presentation, uh, presented a couple of slides that gave uh, 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 an impression by some clinicians that this isn't a common problem, it's a quick and easy operation, and let's move on, and why are we spending so much time on this? So to drive the point home of how common this problem is, I want to uh, talk about data from a couple of articles and then apply that to the number of cholecystectomies done. If you look at this study, this is um, uh, a study by Tham that looked at nearly 2,000 patients coming in for cholecystectomy and stratified them into high risk for having stones versus non-high risk. And you can see the parameters there that they use to decide, is this a high risk patient for having a stone? And any patient that was considered high risk by these parameters was taken to ERCP uh, preoperatively. And what they found was about a 7% uh, rate of uh, stones during the ERCP. So that means that 32% of patients that were classified as high risk ended up having a stone about 2.3% overall. So this is, if I kind of come up with some preoperative strategy to decide if you're high risk and then apply ERCP, we got about a 2.3% chance of finding a stone in that group. If you look at the number of cholecystectomies done in this country per year, it's, it's over 600,000, probably closer to 700,000. But let's take a conservative number, 600,000 and then apply that finding by FAM, you're talking 13,800 cases per year using this kind of risk stratification uh, approach. If we combine that with Cuchieri's description of, uh, of finding stones in asymptomatic patients, right, that's that group, that low risk group that Dr. Finelli talked about, there's a six to 11% chance of finding a stone on routine intraoperative cholangiography in that patient population. And we apply that to the 600,000 patients, you got another 66,000. Combine that, you're talking overall for the patients walking in the door to have their gallbladder taken out, about a 13% chance of finding the stone in those patients. That's significant. So let's talk about the indications for intraoperative cholangiography. And really, as Dr. Finelli pointed out, it kind of falls into, people fall into two groups. I'm a selective cholangiography guy. I only do it uh, when I have some indication by my determination on, on uh, a, a suspicion for stone, or I'm a routine person. I like to do it on everybody. Um, and we heard about this uh, using Dr. Finelli's algorithm where cholangiography fits into that uh, regimen. I would like to make the argument to you that you should be a routine intraoperative cholangiography person. And there are really three strong reasons for why you should do that. The first is this uh, incidence of unsuspected stones. Uh, six to 11% incidence of unsuspected stones. The counter argument that you'll hear to this is, well, yeah, but they were unsuspected. They're small, they're gonna pass on their own. I don't even wanna know about those stones. Uh, the bottom line is, if uh, a patient with a stone in their common bile duct is managed differently, even if you don't take that stone out, they're managed differently and followed differently than someone that's not. And I would also submit to you, and hopefully by the end of today, you'll feel comfortable about this, that there are, there are uh, uh, relatively straightforward strategies to managing that patient to clear that duct, and we shouldn't be walking out of the operating room without doing that. The other thing is that it defines anatomy. And, uh, and this is clearly something that we need to do. With the incidence of common bile duct injury uh, since the advent of laparoscopic cholecystectomy has uh, seemed to stabilize, but is clearly higher than what it was in uh, open chole. We need to do a better job of that. That is a life 
altering complication. And with proper interpretation of intraoperative cholangiography, we can avoid major resectional common bile duct injuries. And then the other thing I would say is training. And this isn't just training my residents. This is training me. This is training my operative staff. As Dr. Finelli uh, mentioned, this is the gateway to being able to do something in the bile duct. If I don't feel comfortable doing cholangiography or my team is not comfortable doing this at the drop of a hat, then I have just limited all of my options for managing uh, biliary issues uh, in, the, uh, in the operating room. And I think this, uh, this quote from Sir Alfred Cushieri uh, summarizes this quite nicely. He says, the surgeon who has not mastered intraoperative fluorocholangiography cannot progress to laparoscopic treatment of ductile calculi. So you just have to feel comfortable doing this. So let's transition to the technique a bit. And these are the things I want to move through rather quickly, starting with room setup and going all the way through to tips and tricks. Um, let's start with room setup. This is just kind of a generic shot, but I like a few of the things that are in this uh, slide. So first of all, there is a C-arm here. And I think that uh, using fluoroscopy for cholangiography has really become the standard. If, that, if you're in a place with limited resources and have to do static images, that can be done well, but clearly fluoroscopy is a more efficient way uh, to manage uh, intraoperative cholangiography. I like the table that they have here with the ability to rotate and space under it for the C-arm, and I'll get back to that. And the other thing I like is this foot pedal here. How many of you, when you do cholangiography, control the x-ray exposure yourself? So that's not a bad number, um, but I would hope that all of you, when you do cholangiography, do that. Clearly, the, the, uh, when the, um, the interventionalist, whether that's a surgeon or some other interventionalist, is controlling the exposure of radiation during the procedure, there are multiple studies to show that radiation exposure is lower during that procedure. It just makes sense. I don't need a tech to guess what I want. I apply it when I need it. This is a little bit of a mock-up, but it gives, me, gives you an understanding of a couple of other things. For me, I like to tuck the right arm because my C-arm's coming in from the right side. I actually angle the bed a touch in the OR to let that C-arm come in. And then we turn the table around so that you can get that C-arm underneath the table uh, and not blocked by the pedestal. Next, once you've got the room set up, let's talk about getting our equipment set up. And, uh, and for cholangiography, uh, part of this is your choice of catheter, and that's going to revolve around, am I going through the cystic duct to do my cholangiogram, or am I going through the gallbladder to do my cholangiogram? There are lots of choices out there uh, for, for what catheter you use. I would submit to you, use something that you can comfortably use and, and are reliable in using it, and that's the best catheter for you. If you're going through the cystic duct, which was the classic kind of approach, um, my preference is to use this, which is an Olsen clamp. Um, it has a non-crushing tip to it, an opening that's offset from that where the catheter comes through. So that kind of looks like that. And it allows me to direct introduction of the cholangiogram catheter into the cystic duct, clamp behind it, and then direct that cholangiography. And I like the ability to be able to manipulate the angulation and orientation of the cystic duct uh, using this clamp. Uh, and so that's an example of it in place. Uh, some people like this catheter, a taut catheter. It has a, a metal uh, tip within the uh, catheter, which is non-crushing. So you can introduce it into the cystic duct, leaving some of that metal exposed, clip uh, temporarily on top of that to hold it in place, do your cholangiogram, and then pull the clip off and take the catheter out. Uh, you can introduce this either through a port or you can do it uh, through a separate angiogram catheter uh, if you want to do it that way. And then there are a number of self, uh, what I call self-fixing catheters. So they have a balloon on the tip or they have the, a basket that expands that holds it into place while you're doing the cholangiography. And I would encourage you just to familiarize yourself with options available out there and then, um, uh, and then use what you can use well. The other option is to go through the gallbladder to do your cholangiography and the Kumar clamp has become quite popular to do this. And so if you're not familiar with this, it's a clamp that's placed across the infundibulum. An offset needle comes out through the, uh, through the shaft of this and is put into the infundibulum. And then you inject through the gallbladder and, and into the um, cystic duct and common duct. 
and that's an option. You, you can imagine limitations of this. If you've got obstruction uh, at the level of the cystic duct infundibulum junction, this might not be very successful. But it's in my institution, many of my colleagues, that's their preferred approach. Let's talk a little bit about injection technique because this isn't just pushing contrast into the duct, pushing a foot pedal, and then getting your, your uh, cholangiogram. You want to be um, accurate in how you do this. And one of the most common things that I see as a, what I consider a mistake is this dark opacification from the initial uh, uh, start of the cholangiogram, which in a, particularly in a dilated ductal system, that dark contrast can completely surround my stone and I may miss that. So I would suggest to use smaller syringes um, and lighter injection of contrast, particularly at the beginning of the imaging. My routine is that I will magnify my uh, fluoroscopy image to focus on the distal duct. Uh, under direct fluoroscopic guidance, do a, a light injection of contrast, uh, lightly opacify that distal duct, ensure that uh, I'm not seeing stones in the part of the duct where it's most likely to have them, and then I can do a darker injection to pacify the rest of the ductal system to ensure that I'm identifying anatomy. So this is not the film I want to see on my initial injection, which is very dark contrast throughout the ductal system. If I have a small stone in here, that can be completely enveloped in contrast and I might not see that. I don't mind this later in the uh, projection to, to define anatomy. Another misunderstanding about radiation exposure is many clinicians think that the x-ray comes from the top and goes to the bottom. It's actually the exact opposite. So the source of the x-ray is from the bottom. It goes to an image intensifier on the top. And so if you're shielding a patient, uh, for instance, you put the lead under them, not on top. And the other thing is you want this intensifier as close to the patient as you can get it. This will minimize radiation scatter. It will also minimize... Uh, um, uh, distortion and magnification. Let's talk a bit about anatomy. How many in the audience would say that this uh, depiction of anatomy, cystic duct joining the lateral side of the common bile duct, is the most common uh, anatomic configuration for that cystic duct common bile duct junction? How many would say that that's the most common orientation? So you might be surprised to find that that's the orientation in about 17% of patients. It's really the minority of patients. This is the uh, breakdown for configuration for the majority of patients. 41% have posterior entry of the cystic duct. 35% it spirals around posterior and joins medial. 7% have this kind of long parallel orientation that joins low. And I want you to remember this when we hear about transcystic exploration later because this can be an issue for you. The other thing you have to remember is that uh, just uh, under 2% of patients, the cystic duct will actually join the right duct. And if you misinterpret this, you may be doing injury to the right ductal system. So you have to have a clear understanding of the anatomy when you're interpreting these films as well. This is your training. You've got to do this routinely to understand what you're looking at. Finally, a couple of tips and tricks, and I want to talk a little bit about rotation, use of morphine, and positioning of the cholangiogram catheter. And I apologize, this is a, the orientation of this isn't exactly right, but I, um, if you have your C-arm in a direct AP orientation and you have your patient completely supine, then you've got your common bile duct overlying your spine. And when you do your imaging, you're not going to get the best image of that duct. Don't forget that that C-arm can rotate and your table can rotate. So rotate one of them to throw it off. If you're, if you're limited on your function of the C-arm, then simply rotate the table about 15 degrees um, to the right. That will throw the duct off of the uh, spine and give you a more clear image. The other thing is this, uh, dealing with this problem. So this is the nightmare cholangiogram, right? I've got, uh, if you're a surgeon and you're in the operating room and this is your cholangiogram, you have, you, you're not done with cholangiography until you've proved to me that I can see this proximal ductal system. And so this might be something as simple as I've got a wide open sphincter of OD and contrast is just moving through, or it's something as complex as I've just damaged the common bile duct or, or, uh, and I don't have proximal filling. We've got to figure that out. Uh, one thing simple if you're using an Olsen clamp is sometimes just repositioning, putting a little bit of traction on the cystic duct, maybe not quite this much, and, and moving things around, you can, get your, you can change your orientation and get that filling. 
Another simple thing, give the patient uh, morphine, get a little spasm of the sphincter of OD to try to get that proximal filling. But you cannot leave the operating room with a cholangiogram like this. Last thing I would say is um, don't orient your instruments to cross the midline like this. So if you're using an Olsen clamp and doing cholangiography, I don't like to introduce it through the epigastric port or this must be a lower port and have it crossing my ductal system. Now that doesn't make sense to me. Bring it in from the right side, keep the duct imaging clean so I can see the entire length. So again, that's my overview for uh, intraoperative cholangiography, indications, setup, technique, and some tips and tricks. Happy to talk about this more during the discussion session. Thank you.